awesome in the place. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place. Hearts on 
Before you today, we gather in your name to commune as a body of Christ, as the body of Christ, as a body of believers, as a body that knows the, the living God personally, as a body that knows the Redeemer lives, as a body that knows that their lives have been touched by the giving, caring, loving Father by a body that knows the true joy in knowing you. Father, we take this time together, collectively, to bring you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory as we offer this service in your name. Amen. Amen. Let us now offer our silent petitions. And let us pray the words our Father gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. i 
Join in if you want to make this your prayer also. All of God's people said, amen. amen, beautiful. Good morning, grace and peace. I want to share with you just a beautiful passage of scripture. Obviously, we'll fit into my message in a few minutes. The 16th chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the king, keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he indeed was the Christ. All that know that this is the word of God, please say amen. Amen. amen.
you turn to your yellow insert, um, we'll review the health of the, the church family. You'll notice the list is long, which means we need to uh, double down on our prayer time, I think. Um, uh, we continue to hold uh, Dennis Cahill up in prayer. Dennis has had a very, very difficult road. He is home. Uh, they have uh, narrowed down um, that he actually had another gold stone stuck in a duck, um, and they discovered it. So the good news is they found the problem, and now they're working towards a solution. Continue to hold Herman up in prayer as he continues to move through testing. Uh, Sandy Cunningham continues to seek your prayer. Uh, she is uh, still, um, I think, with a cast, uh, but uh, again, she can't put any weight on it. And uh, she's home with Jim, who also has a hip issue. Um, and uh, I understand it's not broken, uh, but I think uh, collectively they can use your prayers and maybe a card or two. Um, we lift up Robert in prayer, uh, the son-in-law of Trilla, with health concerns. We also ask you to lift up Hayden Miller, a friend of uh, Julie and Ollie Wilson. Uh, there's been two months early, and so uh, uh, the medical field is incredible in how they're able to deal with preemies. We, they need a special, special prayers and touch. Um, we've been praying for some time now for Maria Stacy. Maria is a sister of Kitty Paprom, who's had pancreatic cancer, terminal, and uh, they're to this place where they're just asking that her suffering be relieved and that she be able to go home to the Father. So hold Maria up in prayer and Kitty and family as well. Um, for Betsy, a uh, friend of Arlene, uh, with surgery complications, we also add Alora, a friend of Lois's, a uh, four-year-old with cystic fibrosis. Um, that's a lifetime of challenges, health issues, and constant prayer. For Elaine, a friend of Lois also, as an 11-year-old with cancer, uh, please lift Elaine up in prayer. Um, for the um, relatives of Millie Edgemont, Millie um, noted that the Townsley family um, had the loss of a grandson who was killed in a motorcycle accident. Um, tragic, uh, sudden. Um, and these are times where faith is really tested. So we ask you to lift up the entire Townsley family. Also ask you to add Bill Value, a relative of the Moonies, uh, to prayer list. Uh, he is in uh, the hospital with COVID and seeks and covets your prayers for the recovery. Let's lift the entire church family up in prayer. As we've seen, change my heart, oh God. Change my heart, oh
Dear Heavenly Father, more than ever today, more than ever this week, more than ever, we need hearts to change. We're a country that is split. We are a country that thinks hate is the answer as long as you win the argument. Father, we're a country so divided that hearts need to change. Hearts need to change starting with us. Hearts need to change with our, our leaders. Hearts need to change in a country where they think abortion is normal. A country where they think prayer in school is somehow obsolete, not necessary. In a country where hate prevails, in a country where we struggle to find our, our roots in a country that was born in Christianity. Father, we heard several pieces of music today. We heard joyful, joyful, we adore thee. There's a line that says, teach us how to love one another. Nothing more powerful than love. Song sung to make us instruments of your peace. It's easy, Father, to rely on and pointing fingers to others. Let's start with ourselves, Father. Let's bring this country back to the Christian principles of raising you up. Father, we do desire to be like you, made in your image, loved as only you can love. And Father, even though we're undeserving sometimes of that love, we fall away from you, you shepherd us back, you're the great shepherd, you bring your flock in. You know us personally, you care for us, you have desires for us, you have concerns for us. Father, we ask you to touch each and every person here who is in pain, who is in sorrow, either for themselves or family members, for co-workers, for people you don't even know but whose situation you can see. We ask you to raise them up. We ask you to be gracious and healing as you always are. Help us to turn to you individually and as a community, Father. Father, we bring our petitions to the foot of the cross. For we know you love your children. And Father, we bring the church family to you. A family in pain, a family in suffering. We ask you to touch Dennis and heal him and her mom that his testing may go well. We ask you to touch the Cunninghams, Sandy and Jim, that they may know that while they are in pain and they are having difficulties, they have a church family that cares and loves them and is praying for them. For Robert, son-in-law, Trilla, you know his health concerns, Father. Let him know that he does not walk alone. And for Hayden, newborn, two-month-old, welcoming him into this world with all the technology that may bring him to wholeness, such that he may someday claim you as his king. For Maria and her illness, give her the peace that passes all understanding. For Betsy, friend of Eileen, complications to Laura, friend of Lois's, and for Elaine, also friend of Lois's, you know their situation. And Father, for the Townsley family, we ask you to lift them up in prayer. We ask you to know that they do not walk alone in their trying times. And for Bill Value, Father, I ask you to 
Bless him, bless his family as he goes through the course of hospitalization with COVID. And Father, there are many unspoken needs here today, spoken from our hearts. You know what they are. We ask you to bless this congregation in your son's holy, blessed name. Amen. I guess I'm supposed to go right into greeting. Hello. <laughs> when you're in prayer, you're, you're, it's sometimes very hard to transition there. So uh, the good news, I was deep in prayer at that point. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I think you might have noticed Pastor Levy's not here today. Um, and he is away on uh, vacation. Um, it is his birthday, so we will save that for next week. And we will sing him happy birthday uh, among, upon his return. We welcome everyone in a red chair. We welcome everyone at home who's uh, joining us from home in safety. Um, but um, we know we miss each other and we love each other and we care for each other. So let's stand and wave and let the person within 20 feet, 30 feet of you know that you care and love them as we sing. <laughs> take a moment if we could and we're going to um, go through uh, business of the church um, we with Norman out we are thrilled to welcome back to the pulpit Reverend Ron that looked like it was a surprise to you you did prepare a sermon right okay <laughs> okay yes you looked awfully surprised there for a moment <laughs> I'm big <thought. laughs> We would have gone out really early today. Um, also, um, the flowers on the platform are given to the glory and honor of Fred and Joan Thomas on their 56th wedding anniversary. He's still good? Still good. Fred, this is where you're supposed to compliment her back. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> okay, 56 years. You think you would have gotten it down by now? Okay. All right. Very good. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. That's what happens when you put God and Christ in the center. Amen. 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 Um, also, if you would, I know that um, the flower charts are out there. Uh, there's some spaces available for free to sign up for them. Uh, if you want a rosebud uh, because of the birth of a grandchild, grandson, child, just make sure you let the uh, church office know and they will make arrangements for you as well. Greeters are needed. Um, it's, it's not a hard job. You wear a suit, you, you, you look good that day and you follow the directions that are given you and uh, it's an easy way to serve. Um, that is uh, one Sunday a month. We also need ushers, again, one Sunday a month. It's not a big commitment. Um, if you could uh, consider that as part of your service, um, you would be servicing the Father and, of course, your local church here at New Life. Uh, please see Pam Brown or Tony, uh, should you be able to contribute and participate there. The bookstore, believe it or not, is still having a sale. Um, at what point do you stop calling a sale a sale? 
is there a point we stop doing that? Um, when, everything, when everything is sold. Um, it is 50% off. If, if you can find a snowman, 50% off. Okay. Um, there's going to be um, uh, the, the church uh, under Pastor Levy is working on, you know, what the next several months look like, uh, given the pandemic, um, you know, how much additional activities can or cannot occur and what manner or form they can occur. So I know they are working hard on that. So uh, we continue to pray for the church, the church family, as we navigate this. And everyone at home, uh, although you're not here, you are loved and you are certainly missed. Um, at this time, we like to take the time to offer our tithes and offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today to return to you what is already yours, to further your kingdom, both here in Newtown and afar. Amen.
Please be seated. Again, good morning and grace and peace. How are you doing? I'm doing well also. I was highly insulted on Friday. I went to the eye doctor and had some laser surgery on my left eye. It wasn't a big deal. But my doctor, a young woman who I love dearly, was hollering at me. I said, I came here to get away from somebody hollering at me, and then I came in here and my insurance company's paying all this money for you to holler at me. Well, if you ever had laser surgery, 
uh, you got to put your chin in, you got to put your forehead in, you open your eyes, they gook up your eye, they put some lens in there, and then they hit you with these beams, trying to reduce the pressure in my eyes. And I apparently wasn't doing it right. And then after about 10 minutes, we found out what the problem was, that I had this slight pr protrusion here, <laughs> and I couldn't get close. So when it was all said and done, she said, Pastor Ron, when you come back in two weeks, I want you to go like this. In other words, push that out and reduce this. So just a little humor, just a little humor. Uh, some of you know that I was on staff at the Emily United Methodist Church for about 13 years after I retired. And of course, eventually came here and this now is my church. But uh, uh, they have been sending uh, a little card every week, the youth group there. And I, I'd just like to take a minute before I really get into what I want to say. What I'm saying now is important. But it says, hello, Ron and Ellie. And uh, it says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And I pray that for each and every one of us. So she goes on to say, what's the difference between Jesus and pizza? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me with this? What's the difference between Jesus and pizza? And being a young, young when I was a young kid, I, I made pizzas for about 12, 13 years as a part-time job. I told people I made a lot of dough in those days. But a uh, dollar an hour and 10 cents a pizza, but it was, it was a lot of dough. Well, the reason, the difference between Jesus and pizza is Jesus can't be topped. Jesus can't be topped, okay? Now, when I, and that's the essence of my message today. No matter who we are, no matter where we've been, no matter where we're going, no matter where we are in our faith walk, there's nothing in this world that can top Jesus because Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of our world. And, and praying that he's our Savior also. So she goes on to say, praying the peace of Jesus to be with you and, and the youth group. So then she goes on to say, here, I read this. This is the words of John Wesley. Do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, in all the times you can, and all the people you can, as long as you can forever. And that's John Wesley. Now, folks, tomorrow is a special day. It's Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It's also the beginning of uh, prayer for unity for our country this coming week. And Lord knows we need to be praying for peace in our country. But with Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we really try to focus on service, service to God and to one another. So I'm challenging each of us to be able to seek out God's will for tomorrow especially, and for all the days that follow, that we could touch another life, that we could call someone, say hello, drop a note, give a word of encouragement, whatever that may be. And then, of course, uh, the week for prayer for Christian unity. We know with inauguration coming uh, next week, we know what happened a week and a half ago. We are living in very, very difficult times, my folks, but I'm convinced if more and more people would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we'd have a much different world. Amen. So we pray that things this coming week and the weeks to follow will go as well as possible, regardless of our political uh, persuasion. So again, good morning to each of you gathered here and to those that are watching at home. I want to just share my heart with you for just a little bit. Uh, I had about a two-week notice about preaching for today. Many of you know that I'm still very, very active in my 80s with funerals and preaching and teaching, etc. And I just love that whenever I get an opportunity. But I said to uh, Ellie this morning, a few weeks ago I was here with three weeks of uh, three hours notice, and today it was two weeks. And I don't know which is easier, to be honest with you. But I prayed about this, and this is what God has put on my heart to share with you today. We are in the second Sunday after the Epiphany. Now, the Epiphany is January the 6th. I told you before, I'll say it again, we have six seasons within the Christian year. We have Advent, which is the beginning of the Christian year. 
we have Christmas, we have Epiphany, we will be in the season of Epiphany until Ash Wednesday when Lent begins, and Lent is a preparation for Easter for Holy Week, and then we move into the Christian season of Pentecost. So this past Christmas was very, very different for each of us, I'm sure. I know it was for our family. Uh, we had some family that were sick, and uh, we lost a couple of loved ones, uh, friends. I lost a very close cousin just a couple of weeks ago. It was a different Christmas, to be sure, yet Jesus Christ was still sick for him some the Christmas decorations are put away. No more singing Christmas carols for another year. I was singing Christmas. I wasn't singing. I was listening to Christmas carols just up to the other day in, in my car. No more old Christmas movies. I love the old movies. Give me some movies from the 30s or 40s or 50s. Any movie made after the 50s to me is new. So anyway, uh, give me a Diet Coke with a little ice and some sugar-free cookies and sit and turn It's a Wonderful Life, Miracle on 34th Street. It happened on Fifth Avenue and Christmas in Connecticut, and I could go on and on. So Christmas is past, trusting that the spirit of Christmas is still lingering in your heart and my heart. God came among us 2,000 years ago in that babe in Bethlehem. It's God incarnated. It's what we call the incarnation. We have a blessed trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but Almighty God came among us in his babe, Jesus. We say Jesus is the Son of God. It's really God in human form. And my whole emphasis for us today is to be sure that without a shadow of a doubt, do you and I truly believe in this one that came among us 2,000 years ago, and we've made a commitment to receive him as our personal Savior. The Sunday before Christmas, Ellie and I visited our son, Ron, and his his wife, Deb, and they live in Berks County, and her parents, so they're 90 and 92, and a little fragile. And there were six of us, but we kept our distance, and uh, we did have a good, a good time together. But uh, when the meal was over, our son, Ron, said, Mom and Dad, could you say something virtually to the rest of our family? And this is what I said. I love every one of you, even though we haven't been able to visit. I love you. We love you. We're praying for you. And what I'm praying for most of all this Christmas, that all of you, my family, really know the true meaning of Christmas, that Jesus Christ came among us as a babe and grew to be the Savior of the world. And I said to all of our kids and our grandkids, our great-grandkids are a little bit young, I said, the greatest Christmas present you could give to Almighty God and to your mother and father and to your grandparents is to know that every one of you knows Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. For folks, I'm getting a little choked up because I really struggle with many in our family who basically have turned their back on Almighty God. I don't know how many heard what I said and then Ellie spoke. Pretty much the same thing. So this is our prayer. This is our prayer, that us and all of our loved ones, at some point, even maybe today, have said yes to Jesus Christ. Now, it may seem strange <clears throat> to have a sermon in a church with believers entitled, Who is Jesus? What a question to ask the church, yet many around the world have never heard the name of Jesus. Many have heard the name of Jesus, but have not yet responded. We have heard the name of Jesus, those of us gathered here. How have we responded? Is Jesus our Savior? Have we been born again, meaning spiritually? We need two births, Jesus tells Nicodemus in the third chapter of John. We have a physical birth, and then we need to have a spiritual birth. So that's what I'm all about for the next 20 or 25 minutes. Who is Jesus? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, friends. There is a place called heaven that's big enough to receive all who believe. And I say this at every funeral I officiate. I had 24 funerals last year. Already I've had two. And on Friday I had one that was scheduled, but I couldn't do it because of this laser surgery. But I tell all of them as I share the gospel that there's a place called heaven that's big enough to receive 
all who believe. Friends, I don't have to tell you that we live in a broken world, a world that desperately needs our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I understood as a very young boy growing up in a tough area of Kensington in the 40s and early 50s, and growing up in a very dysfunctional family, and maybe you have some of the same stories that I have had. It was a tough, tough place. It was a tough household to grow up into. The only time I ever heard the name of Jesus or Christ was in profanity. I did not know at seven or eight who Jesus was. I only heard that name Jesus or Christ in profanity and how sad it was. And then right around that time when this Baptist church came into our community, and I've said this to you before, with a vacation Bible school, I really began to understand who Jesus is. When you said Jesus, I began at that young age of about eight to understand who Jesus really is. The church's main responsibility is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. People need to be invited to go and receive Christ as Savior and then be about witnessing, go tell it on the mountain. So everyone will hear and hopefully respond, and I trust that you and I have done so. The church in general, in my opinion, has really failed in its witness. Uh, go tell it on the mountain. Some, I know believers that uh, have made their salvation an absolute secret, that nobody even knows they're a believer. <clears throat> we need to know that our salvation is secure by faith in Jesus Christ alone, and we're willing to witness each in our own way as Almighty God would lead us. Invite others to come here to New Life, a Christian church. You and I as believers need to be very, very aware that people are watching us. People were watching me when I went into the ministry 35 years ago. Uh, the first church that Ellie and I served in Lebanon County, uh, they were so suspicious of us because uh, we were not one of them that we were born and raised in Philadelphia as kids, and they were very, very, very suspicious. One person said to me, how in the world can anyone that grew up in Philadelphia just to Lebanon County? And I said, well, my parents moved to Bucks County in 1953, and believe me, that was real country back in those days. So people are watching you and I as believers to see if there's any real difference and what we proclaim to be. Quickly, five areas, and I've said this to you before. I'd like to say it again. If you take the word watch, W-A-T-C-H. If you take the W in the word watch, I like to think of it being words. Watch our words. You and I really need to be careful as believers when we're trying to give a proper example for the rest of the world. We need to watch our words. We really need to watch what we say. Secondly, the word A in the word watch stands for actions. You and I need to be careful about our actions. Thirdly, the, the, word, the letter T in the word watch for thoughts. We need to be careful about what we think, what we think. And that's been a problem with me in past years of thinking things that I should not have been thinking about. Then the C in the word watch for our conscience. Listen to that inner being what God is speaking to us. And lastly, the letter H in the word watch, to watch our hearts, that our hearts are right with Almighty God and are right with one another. Now, I said this to you before, and I'd like to say it again. If someone came to you or me and said, I know that you're a Christian and you attend a church, whether it's here or someplace else, I want what you have. Will you help me? How would you or I respond to the question, who is Jesus? I'd like to reread for you a couple of verses, again from Matthew 16, verses 15 through 17. This answers the question of who is Jesus. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? This is Jesus speaking. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven, but my father who is in heaven. Friends, that's who Jesus is. 
He's not just a teacher or a Jew or a rabbi or whatever folks would call him or a miracle worker. Jesus Christ is the son of almighty God who came to be your savior and my savior. God looked down upon humankind after thousands of years of folks breaking covenants, renewing covenants, breaking covenants. God must have said, I need to come down among them. The world was so full of sin and continues to be full of sin. No more Old, animal, old Testament animal sacrifices. Almighty God said, I'm going to come down. I am not coming as a, 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 on a white horse. I'm coming as a babe born in Bethlehem to grow and to be their savior. Friends, sin, again, is the issue that separates us from Almighty God. Sin is what destroys a relationship between God and us. When sin came into the world in the very beginning with Adam and Eve, and we call it the doctrine of original sin, there was a separation between God and humankind. But when Jesus came into the world, he bridged that so that you and I have a connection, can get back to Almighty God by repentance and by faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus paid it all. Your sin, my sin. If we honestly repent of our sin, the scriptures say that Almighty God will put our sins behind his back, remembering them against us no more. It's all about God's grace, amazing grace. We may not understand it all. That is the gift of salvation, but folks, it's true. God's word is truth. We choose either heaven or we choose hell. We can receive eternal life, but how? Again, repenting of our sins, receiving Jesus as personal Savior, then be full of the Holy Spirit and trying to live with God's help an obedient life. Folks, Jesus is the answer to all of life's struggles and challenges and blessings. It doesn't mean when we become a believer that all of our problems go away, no. But we know and trust by faith that God is with us, that Jesus is praying for us. We have the community of faith, love and prayers for one another. And we know that this life is not all there is for the believer. For the believer, there's a life eternal. So who is Jesus? That's the question for today. That's the question that concerns so many. Christianity really is about Jesus, about following him, about being in relationship with him as Messiah, son of God, hope of the world, both in life and death. So who is Jesus? That's the question. We have a rich text before us that I just reread today. This episode found in all of the synoptic gospels now. I read this from Matthew. The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the word synoptic means that they're similar. But the Gospel of John is much different. The account that I just read is found in all, all four Gospels. Therefore, I think that it is so, so important for us to read it and to understand it, to know that Jesus indeed is the Son of God, the Savior of our world. Christians are those who believe when everything has been said and done, all that matters is who do we say that Jesus is. Jesus refused in his earthly ministry to be stiff-armed by anybody into following him. We live with free will. He refused to dominate or to take up arms. Looking at his life's work, many people would say that Jesus was one of history's most notable failures. We know that he was not. He rode a donkey, not a white horse. He had a crown of thorns. He was not born in a palace, but in a stable. He grew up in poor Nazareth, not in Jerusalem. So it wasn't just that God came in Jesus. It was that God came in Jesus to be your savior and to be my savior. Friends, we love God because we believe that God first loved us in Jesus. We love God, we believe in Jesus, because Almighty God first loved us. And if Easter had not happened, who would still think about Jesus? But Easter did happen, and Jesus is alive. 
We know he lives because he lives within our hearts. This babe in Bethlehem, born 2,000 years ago to peasant parents, in that little place called Bethlehem, just outside of Jerusalem, in a stable or in a barn or in a cave or wherever it may be, 30 years later began a ministry that lasted three years, and we're still talking about it today, and we'll be talking about it until Jesus comes again. Friends, God came to us in Jesus 2,000 years ago, grew to be our Savior. In Jesus' lifetime, he did many wonderful things, but his ultimate purpose was to go to that old rugged cross to suffer and die for you and for me. His broken body and his shed blood was out of absolute love for each and every one of us today. We need to feel good about that. We need to rejoice in it, and we need to give eternal thanks. And monthly, we share in the sacrament of Holy Communion with the bread and juice. And these are the elements that Jesus took in that upper room the night before he was crucified, saying, I break the bread, this is my body, which will be broken for you. Then the cup, this is my blood, that will be shed for you. So whenever we participate in Holy Communion, it's a constant reminder, these elements of bread and juice. Not like our Catholic brothers and sisters, they have what they call transubstantiation, where they actually believe these elements become the actual body and blood of Christ. And if that's what they believe, fine. But these elements that we participate in, the bread and the juice, remembering the body of Christ broken for us and the blood of Christ shed for us. And each time I sit in those chairs or I'm standing here or wherever I may be, it's a precious time whenever I can share in the sacrament of Holy Communion. We don't deserve it, but out of God's love, he has given it to us. Dear friends, we love God because we believe that God first loved us. Yes, uh, if Easter hadn't happened, who would be thinking about Jesus today? And again, I repeat, but Easter did happen. Jesus is alive. We know he lives because he lives within our hearts. Folks, Jesus was crucified, dead and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. And for 40 days, he made post-resurrection appearances to many of that are recorded in Scripture. And 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus ascended to be back, go back to the Heavenly Father and gave to us, uh, really, that great commission to all of us, he's speaking, go into all the world and preach the gospel and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I'll be with you until the end of the age. And then 10 days later, we have what we call Pentecost. When Peter was preaching in Jerusalem and thousands were being saved, and the Holy Spirit came upon them in such a powerful way. And folks, really, that is the beginning of the church, which we represent here today. We have a precious church and a body of Christ, a good pastor and leadership, and brothers and sisters of the faith. We need to understand, however, that nothing lasts forever unless we continue to work at it. The church I grew up in, the Allegheny Avenue Baptist Church in the corner of Frankfurt and Allegheny, some of you may be familiar with that area. Uh, that church was so precious to me. I was there for about uh, eight or nine years, I guess, until I turned 16 and my parents came to Trevo's church. I began in the Trevo's United Methodist Church as a young believer. But friends, that first church, uh, if it had not been for them, I probably would not be standing here today. They witnessed in our community in a vacation Bible school, invited my brother Bob and I to come the Sunday school and then the church, and we gave our hearts and lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, were baptized in that church, became members, and that place really basically saved my brother's lives and me, because we all came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, having said that, it breaks my heart that that powerful church has no longer there. There's something in there now. The name on the side of the building is changed. It breaks our hearts when we see churches close, churches dwindling, and it's happening all over the place. Friends, we have a good church here, but we need to be faithful to the Lord and to our church and continue to attend when we can, to view at home, to pray for the church, to pray for the pastor, pray for one another, giving to the church and all these other things. This is our church, 
We want to remain strong and vital and faithful in proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, not just on Sunday, but seven days a week. And I'm going to say something else that I probably have shared with you in the past, but I think it fits uh, beautifully into what I'm trying to say. Our Christian experience is not just the Sunday experience, but rather a seven day a week. We come to worship, whether we're here or at home, with Bible studies and other activities, and we're very limited right now because of this virus. But pray that as we move into this, this coming year, that we can be getting together more and more often, and more of us will be, in fact, together. But Christian faith is more than Sunday worship. It's really being a seven day a week Christian. I told you this, and I'll say it again. The first time I preached in public, I was the grand old age of 17, back in 1954, and I just gave my age away, but I don't care. Anyway, somebody says, gee whiz, you don't look like you're 83. I said, friend, just watch me walk, <laughs> and you'll know what I mean. I, uh, I've been sitting down sometimes when I'm up here for the singing. I was going to joke with you, and I had this eye surgery. I thought the doctor said put drops in three times a day for five days and don't stand too much. Um, getting eye surgery, don't stand too much. It's a joke, folks. It's a joke. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about this thing here. But anyway, in 1954, I was asked to preach at the Simpson Grove Camp meeting in Trevos, PA. It was a large crowd. I had just come home from Pocono Plateau with some of you. Had a, had a Methodist background, know what I'm talking about. And that was the theme, being a seven-day-a-week Christian. So we come and we worship every Sunday here or at home or wherever we are. But it's more than a day. It's each and every day, seven days a week, living the Christian life. Daily devotions, worship, giving to the church, witnessing, reaching out to one another. I'm just challenging all of us to take our faith walk seriously, to take the work of the church seriously. I first got acquainted with Jesus when I was a young boy, as I said, growing up in that Baptist church, and I can remember vividly singing, Jesus Loves Me in Sunday School and Vacation Bible School, probably the summer of 1944. And I watched the teacher move. Now, I'm giving my age away now. Watching the Sunday School teacher move cutout figures across the flannel graph. Any of you, any of you old enough to remember that? They're moving these figures across a flannel graph. And I associated Jesus with those stories and, of course, with Kool-Aid and sugar cookies and gold stars for good attendance and attendance pins and also the gift of my first Holy Bible that was given to me at a young age by a Philadelphia cop on the corner of Frankfurt and Clearfield where I was on the safety patrol in the fifth and sixth grade. It's a Phillips version, my first Bible, and I'm so, so thankful. I remember the picture in the Fellowship Hall in the back of the stage uh, of a picture of Jesus wearing a white robe, and folks, in his arms, Jesus is cradling a little baby lamb who was asleep. And I try to imagine that I was that little lamb asleep in Jesus' arms because I'll tell you, folks, I grew up in a terrible household, I'm sorry to say, but I felt safe there. I knew that God was there and there were godly people that cared about, hear this, that skinny little kid named Ronstadt. And believe me, folks, I was skinny. Yes, uh, and then, of course, uh, moving from the city uh, to uh, the Trevos area. Uh, it broke my heart that I had to leave that church. The church is a precious thing. It's the primary vehicle that Almighty God is using to convey the gospel to the world. It's not the only way, but I believe it's the primary way. You and I need to be secure in our faith, be willing to witness, and take the work and support of our church seriously. So as I end... Could it be true that this Bethlehem story of a creator descending to be born on this little planet, if so, it's a story like no other. There is no other story like it. When God came into the world in Jesus, 
Little wonder a choir of angels broke out in spontaneous song, disturbing not only a few shepherds, but the entire universe. So come again, Lord Jesus, love us and forgive us and save us. Disturb us, Lord Jesus, again and again. Help us to be obedient. So who is Jesus? My friends, my brothers and sisters, I hope this day and every day we can say, who is Jesus? He is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and he is my Savior too. We trust by faith. I'm almost done. Faith, Christian faith, has its rewards. Hear this. Faith brings forgiveness. Through Jesus, the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you, to all of us. That's Acts 13, 38. Faith brings salvation. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Folks, I hope you get that. 1 Peter 1, 9. Faith brings peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 1. Faith makes us stronger. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, will soar on wings like eagles. Isaiah 40, 31. Faith is a shield. Take up the shield of faith with which you, cannot, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. That's Ephesians 6, 16. Faith is rewarded. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded, Hebrews 10.35. So faith is the sharing of our time, our talents, and our resources, all of God's gifts to us. Freely you have received, freely you give, Matthew 10, verse 8. I apologize for this. And lastly, for thine is the power. We have power, my friends, in almighty God if we're plugged into the power that indeed runs this universe. I want you to think of a light switch in your house. When you want light, you flip it on. When you leave the room, you flip it off. Our power coming from the Holy Spirit always needs to be on the on position. Like the power of electricity, faith is believing what we do not see. When faith guides our steps, <clears throat> life becomes easier. It's a matter of keeping our switch in the on position. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Hebrews 11, 1. Folks, it's all, it's all about faith. It's all about putting our hand in the hand of God and believing in Jesus Christ as Savior, then going and helping someone else to do the same I've shared a beautiful poem with you on a few occasions, and I'd like to kind of end with this. I think it's so, so important. It talks about putting our hand in the hand of God. I said to a man who stood at the gate, give me a light that I might walk safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of God, and it will be, it will be to you better than a light and safer than any known way. End of quote. Folks, we need to put our hand in the hand of God and receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. There's just no other way to receive the gift of eternal life. We need to put our hand in the hand of God and receive Jesus Christ and trust by faith and then go help someone else to do the same. Friends, life's important decisions cannot be forever postponed. Eventually, a crisis comes, and we must demonstrate who we are and to whose we are and where our commitments lie. The gospel, today's gospel, calls for a verdict, a decision. <clears throat> now, my friends, is the time to decide if we have or have not received Jesus Christ as Savior. My friends, who is Jesus? He's the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer? And just quietly, <clears throat> if there's anyone here this day who has never said yet, yes to Jesus, you can do it right now. Help me to lead you through this prayer. Simply say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I'm so sorry. And I believe and want to receive you as my personal Savior. 
I want you to save me, Lord. I want the gift of eternal life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. And maybe in this new year, you might want to recommit your life to Almighty God and to ministry and mission and the life of our church. You can do that right now, simply saying, Lord, I recommit my life to you. I am a believer. Help me in this new year to be more obedient to your will and way. Yes, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's join the course of commitment, Jesus' name above all names. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. I truly, you're welcome, I truly, truly, truly hope and pray that when you and I leave God's house to go to our house, that you can say without a shadow of a doubt that we know who Jesus is. He is my Lord and my Savior. And I love him because he first loved me and he gave us all for me. And out of that love, we receive him. We may not understand it all, but that's okay. We're not called biblically to understand it all. We're only called to believe, that we believe that this one Jesus, the Son of God, came among us and hung on that old rugged cross and three days later rose from the dead, eventually ascended. Friends, Jesus has come, and Jesus is coming again. Whether it's in our lifetime or not, doesn't matter. Christ has come, Jesus is coming again. Are we spiritually ready? I pray that we are. Let's bow for benediction. Our Heavenly Father, as we go our separate ways until we meet together again, let us go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may our Lord and mighty God bless and keep you forever and grant you peace, perfect peace, peace in all of life's endeavors. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace. Amen.